lecturer and postdoctoral scientist at Princeton University, and he became assistant professor at the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State in 2006, and now is a full professor there. He is a member of Arizona State University Social Insect Research Group, which I find fascinating that there is a research group studying insects, um, which studies the evolution and organization of, of insects uh, societies from the level of gene all the way uh, to the ecology and um, evolution. Um, besides being, of course, a wonderful researcher who brings in millions of dollars to the, um, to the group, to CERC, um, Dr. Prada is also a, a wonderful lecturer. And of course, if you go and Google him on Rate My Professor, uh, you, you will get some interesting feedback. So I will just read you one. Dr. Pratt taught the first half of my Bio 3400 course and was awesome. His lectures are crystal clear, which makes it easy to prepare for exams. Of course, that's super important. Every now and then again, he would even throw in a few jokes to lighten us up. I really enjoyed his course and I highly recommend it. So I'm, I'm hoping for, for similar, a bit of uh, light insect um, science uh, on Friday afternoon. Okay. Please help me uh, welcome Dr. Pratt. Thanks very much uh, for that uh, kind introduction and for inviting me here. Um, it turns out you can go and leave your own ratings on Rate My Professor if you know what you're doing. So. <laughs> Um, um, it's, uh, it's really great to be here. I've, I've had a really uh, nice day talking to a lot of interesting people. Um, and I, it's not often I have a little picture of myself on the posters that are advertising my talks, especially you know, not when I'm teaching genetics or statistics. So thank you very much for the really warm welcome. So what I'm going to talk about today um, is social insects. And in particular, I want to talk about uh, my work on the collective organization of ant colonies. And ant colonies, or social insects in general, have been described as the, the other great pinnacle of social evolution other than ourselves. And a lot of the interest in, in their, their biology is about their evolution. How is it that these individuals with conflicting interests have been able to uh, evolve into these highly cooperative societies, so cooperative that, in fact, if you look at a typical society, there will be one individual who does all the reproduction, the queen, and everyone else is just helping her. And that's a very interesting topic. In its, in its own right, but, but what I want to talk about is another aspect of that. Given that these highly cooperative societies have evolved, that has created the opportunity for the evolution of remarkable mechanisms of highly coordinated behavior. So what I'm really interested in is how these colonies work, how they function together to create a remarkable group activities such as building complex nests, uh, making decisions, organizing collective defense, organizing complex foraging um, forces, et cetera. Um, and what, one of the things that makes it so interesting to, to figure out the how of these, these problems is that the colonies are wonderful examples of decentralized systems. Nobody's in charge. There's a queen who is the sort of leader in the sense that she's the one reproducing. Everyone is, is working towards her reproductive ends, but she's not the leader in the sense of telling anyone what to do. Um, instead, no one's in charge, and yet effective behavior emerges from interactions among all these locally informed individuals following the, the proper rules. So the work I'm going to describe is basically aimed at trying to understand what those rules are, how these colonies function, but also considering something of the implications of those, um, those, those uh, mechanisms for how uh, they process information and act as a sort of collective brain. So this, th this is an entire colony of, of ants you're looking at there. It's called uh, Temnothorax regatulus. A, you don't have to remember that name. It won't be a quiz. Uh, they aren't usually this colorful. I paint them all. One of the things is that if, if you're familiar with ant colonies, more dramatic ant colonies or social insect colonies, they may have thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of members. These colonies are very small, like 100 ants. But that's good for what I want to do because it means that we can get very detailed data on the behavior of each and every individual ant because we've individually marked them. And we can video record the colony as it carries out some task, and then we can reconstruct the contributions of each of these ants to that task. And the main sort of system we, look, we consider here is how they make decisions about where to live. So ants are famous for a couple of things. One is uh, uh, walking in trails, chemical trails, and the other one is living in anthills. And these ants don't do either one of those things. Uh, as you'll see, they recruit in a very different way, not with trails. And they don't live in the, in, in the soil. They live in rock crevice nests. So if you find this rock here out there in the woods in the mountains uh, 
two hours outside Phoenix and you look more closely and flip open a little flake of it, uh, you will be able to see, if you look really closely, it might be hard to see in this light, but ants are in there. They basically live in a little crevice about the size of my hand. Uh, the entire colony is, is, is slotted into this tiny crevice. And this means a couple of things. One of them is they don't build their own nests, so they have to instead find nests and select them for many possible homes. And the other thing is the nests are somewhat fragile, and so it's not unlikely that they'll have to move. And so they've become very good at organizing emigrations in which they not only move the colony all together to one location, but they're able to pick the best of many available locations. So what we're interested in, in large part is how they solve that problem. We don't do it in the field. We bring them into the lab. We, we, we house them in artificial cavities made out of wood and glass that sort of duplicate some of the geometry of, of their natural nests. And then we pose problems in a dish, basically a dish like this. It's about a meter across diagonally. And we can create a decision problem for them by putting a colony here in its nest, offering it two new nests, perhaps of different design, and then forcing them to move by destroying their nest, by lifting off the roof. And then over the next few hours, they'll make a decision. And we will eventually find the colony moved into one or the other of those two nests. So one thing you can do with that kind of simple experiment is find out what they like in a nest. And we find out they have very strong preferences. So these three nest designs here would be going from good to bad, moving from left to right. The one on the left, nest A, nice big cavity, tiny little entrance, easily defended, probably helps them maintain an, a nice internal environment. The one in the middle, not so good. The entrance is a bit large. The one on the right, terrible. Tiny cavity, enormous entrance. It does provide shelter, but not nearly as good as the, as the other two. And there's, and there's many other factors besides these that, that they pay attention to um, and, and have very clear preferences for when, when they make these collective choices. Now, one of the interesting things about how they do this is you could imagine that the way they make a choice is they, there's basically just two kinds of nests in the world. There's nests that are suitable, that are adequate, and nests that are not. And all you gotta do when, you, when you're looking for a nest is judge it, is this good enough or is it not good enough? And then if it's not, go, keep looking. If it is, you're done. Um, but they don't do that. They do something a bit more sophisticated. If you give them a choice between nest types B and C from that previous um, slide, they show a strong preference for B. So all the you give many colonies a choice, almost all of them will pick B uh, rather than C. Uh, but if you instead give them A versus B, the previously favored B will be almost totally rejected in favor of A. So in other words, they are assessing the currently available option set, comparing those options and figuring out which of, the, of, that, of that particular set is, a, is, is the best. That's a more powerful way of making decisions, but also a more challenging one. So one of our original questions about, about their behavior is how they do that. And to sort of describe how they do that or tell you a little bit of what we learned about how they do that, let me just describe the sort of process of what happens. So you take this nest and you destroy it. Scout ants leave the destroyed nest and begin searching the arena. And uh, eventually, one of these scouts will find a site, and she will spend quite a bit of time assessing it inside and out. And then if the site is good enough, she'll go back to the old nest, and she'll start doing the behavior you see here. It's called a tandem run. This, nest, this ant in the front is the successful scout. The ant following her is a, a naive scout that she, want, or she wants to bring to visit the site that she's found. And they do this behavior, has distinctive features. You'll see the, it frequently pauses. The leader, it turns out, is releasing a chemical signal that attracts the follower. But you see the way the leader periodically stops. She stops whenever she doesn't feel the touch of the follower's antennae on her abdomen. Once that, she, it, that touch is restored, then she moves. If it's gone, she stops. That way they stay together as they move across uh, uh, the arena until they finally get to the destination and that recruited ant will be able to make, do the same thing as the, as the leader did. She'll be able to assess the site. She too may start doing these tandem runs. And in that way, you get positive feedback that gradually builds up the number of ants visit, visiting the site. That goes on for a while, but at some point it stops. And rather than going back and doing tandem runs, they do what this ant is doing. They simply pick up an ant and carry her. <laughs> and as you'll see, uh, it goes a lot faster. Uh, this, this, she'll speed right across. I, I, you know, I, I will be able to get through this whole slide and you'll see the, the arrive at the destination and bring that transported ant into the nest. Um, so what's happening here, it turns out, is that we have two different types of, of recruitment behavior, tandem run and transport, directed at two different types of ants at two different phases of the immigration. So what happens essentially is that early on, um, the specialized scout ants 
who are actually out there finding nests, assessing them, and sharing information about them use tandem runs to recruit one another. But once a, a sufficient number of those scouts have been brought to a site, they switch over to the transport, and they direct that transport activity mainly at the passive majority of the colony who's just been cowering at the destroyed nest all this time, waiting to be carried. Um, and we can see that because it turns out that if you look at the behavior of those individual scouts, they follow what we call a quorum rule. Every time they complete one of those tandem runs, they assess how many ants are inside the site they're recruiting to. And they seem to do this basically just by, by responding to their rate of physical encounters with other ants inside the nest, almost like the ping pong, you know, billiard balls bouncing off of each other. And once that encounter rate is high enough, they abandon the tandem runs and they move to transport. So we have this sort of quorum rule here. So the tandem runs recruit the scouts, the transport recruits, recruits the passive majority of the nest, and the switch is governed by this quorum rule. The one other thing I should say about their, their decision making is that when an ant finds a site, her probability of starting to recruit to it by either means depends on how good it is. So she's basically assessing her direct information about how good the site is. And the better she judges it to be, the more likely she is to start doing the recruitment versus just continue searching. Now we can put all that together into a sort of algorithm, a decision algorithm that is used by these these scout ants, these, these active ants who are responsible for organizing emigration. And it's kind of a stepwise uh, uh, series of increasing levels of commitment to a site. The first thing is the ant has to decide we need to search for a new site. So she leaves the nest and looks. Then she finds a site and she begins to assess it. And, she gather, and this is itself a very interesting problem. How does she gather all this information and make judgments about it? But she somehow does that, and she makes a conclusion about how good it is, and then depending on how good it is, she'll show a higher or lower probability of then moving to the next phase of recruiting. But here she has to make another decision. If the population of the nest is below the quorum, she'll do tandem runs. But if it's above the quorum, she will move ahead into full commitment. Use that picture as well. And she'll start transporting the passive majority of the nest. So it's this stepwise graded algorithm. And part of it is, and there's two components here that are, that are actually common to collective decision making across the social insects. The first one is this quality dependent recruitment that creates positive feedback that is stronger for better options than for worse ones. But the other one is this quorum rule, this, which essentially introduces a kind of non-linearity. So basically it can amplify the difference created by those, those um, differential recruitment rates to better or worse nests and make it more likely that the colony will complete its emigration to one single nest, the best nest, before a competing nest of lower quality has reached the quorum and, and moved into the transport phase. Another way of thinking of it is that these scout ants are really combining two kinds of information. In the assessment phase, they get their, their direct knowledge of what, the, what their particular nest is like. And in the assessment, in, in the, um, in the, it, by, by this quorum rule, they get information, social information from other ants who basically by visiting their nest and continuing to revisit and building its population essentially give a clue that this nest, is, you didn't just make a mistake, other ants agree with you, this is a pretty good site. Right? And if you ha we have, and we've shown by a, both by observation of, and experiment and by uh, mathematical models of in agents following these rules, that this can create a a viable and, and repeatable choice of the best nest, consensus on the best nest in most occasions, even though few, if any, single ants ever visit more than one site. So it's a truly decentralized decision. It's not that any one of these ants visits both and says, ah, that's a better one. Instead, there's a competition going on between ants who only know about site A and ants who only know about site B, but by virtue of the rules shown in this, in this simple algorithm, that, that will generate the desired outcome. That's the kind of very shorthand view of, of what we took a long time to learn. Um, what I you know, what I want to um, sort of talk about now is some of the implications of using this highly nonlinear quorum rule based system. And one of, these, one of the ways you can see the power of, of this nonlinearity is if you ask, well, what happens if the two nests are identical? What if you've got, so there's no difference in recruitment you know, initiation rate, like because the new two nests are the same. Every ant who goes to site A is going to act the same as every ant who goes to site B. Um, and so we can cre create that situation here. We have to be very careful with these screens here are to keep the light level identical on either side because they're, ex as you'll see later, they're extremely sensitive to light level. They really don't like the light. But we can create these situations with two identical nests. And what we see is you might get two outcomes. One is it might be a very hard problem to solve and they just split 
the colony you get, which is not good for the colony. The colony wants to achieve consensus and keep the colony united at its new home. Or they could randomly pick one or the other. And this, the latter is what they actually do. So this is a, a histogram, really, of outcomes of a bunch of different trials with different colonies. And essentially, if you look at these bars on the left or the right, that indicates occasion in which the colony moved entirely into the, the, the nest on the left or entirely into the nest on the right. These ones in the middle represent a couple of cases where they partially split. But as you can see, they usually pick one. And it's, it's random which one it is. So they're basically able to use this kind of positive feedback and nonlinear uh, decision making to generate a symmetry breaking. So where you take two initially equivalent sites, and there might be some random difference in how many ants happen to show up at, at site A versus site B. The positive feedback in this quorum rule can amplify those random differences and, and turn what would otherwise be a split decision into a consensus on one side or the other, which is a powerful functional outcome for a colony trying to maintain unity. Um, I think, though, that maybe a better insight into the, into the function of this quorum rule uh, can be seen if you consider a, a totally different context in which they also use tandem runs and they also make decisions, but they don't have a quorum rule. And that's foraging. So these ants here are, these attractive little ants are sipping at a little tiny pond of sugar water, which ants love. This, this is one way in which they are just like all the other ants. They love sugar water. And they will recruit to this just as using tandem runs, just as they do to, to potential new homes. Um, and we can, we've, we've done a fair amount of observation of how they do this behavior. And I can, you know, we can set up a simple um, version of the decision problem I showed you for nests, only now it's feeders instead of nests. A weak 0.1 molar sucrose solution or a strong, very sweet one, 0.8 molars. Uh, they're gonna, we, we expect them to prefer the 0.8 molar one. And if we look at their behavior, we see that they follow, um, again, a fairly simple set of rules, uh, similar to what we see for the nest uh, emigration, but not quite the same. And so basically, we, we can th think of our, our foraging ants as being one of three categories. They're uncommitted ants who haven't found any food or don't like the food they have found. And we've got ants who found feeder A and liked it and started exploiting it, or ants who found feeder B and liked it and started exploiting it. And we can go from one compartment to another in this model really by just a, a few simple behaviors. Uncommitted ants discover a site, start eating there, or uncommitted ants are recruited by a tandem run to a site. And finally, they give up sometimes, they stop. Even while there's still food there, ants will, will just randomly stop eating and go home. So it's um, these simple measures, it turns out, but the, the recruitment rates and the attrition rates, it turns out, are quality dependent. So the better the food is, the more likely you are to lead a tandem run, the less likely you are to, to give up and, and, and return home. And those simple um, rules are enough to, to drive uh, the majority of foraging to a better site over a worse one. So you might see a situation like this. Again, the same sort of um, display here where I'm showing a histogram of outcomes of many different experiments with different colonies. And if the right feeder um, is, is the, um, uh, uh, if the left feeder is the better feeder, we'll see here that most of the ants are, are foraging at the left feeder and fewer than at the right feeder. So the, essentially the colony is making a collective decision effectively. But the thing is, what happens if you give them two identical feeders? You don't get the same picture as in immigration. They, here they do, in fact, just split. Most, in most trials, half the foragers end up at one feeder and half at the other. You have a few rare cases where they're mainly at one or the other. So it's the opposite pattern. Rather than that U-shaped pattern we have for the nests, it's more of like a normal distribution. And the, the crucial me uh, mecha mechanistic difference in how they make a decision is that they're not using any kind of quorum here. There's no um, feedback on their behavior for how many ants have already visited the, the food. Um, and the, in the absence of that nonlinear uh, non quorum rule, we don't get the disruptive symmetry breaking. Functionally, it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, for, for choosing a home, is, consensus is vital. But for exploiting food, not so much. It doesn't really matter whether they don't need to have all the ants at one feeder versus another. In fact, it's arguably better to, to spread them out over multiple feeders. Um, the other thing about this is because they don't have this nonlinearity that, that can really amplify and focus their effort, they're also quite flexible in their foraging. So if we take, in this experiment on the left, if we start off with the left feeder is good and the right feeder is not so good, halfway through we can trick them, we can switch them. And the ants are pretty good at responding to that and shifting their uh, exploitation to track 
the dynamic change in resources. And that, again, is probably something that is more effective in the, in the absence of these, these, constant, these amplifying nonlinearities such as the quorum rule. Now, that whole story I've told you is a very detailed one and a very, it's about a particular set of species of closely related ants, tendothorax ants. I could tell you other sorts of mechanisms that have many of the same features for other kinds of ants that use pheromone trails, for example. But the one, the other species that's most interesting is honeybees. Honeybees are sort of a more glamorous version of tendothorax ants. That's the way I, I used to study them. Very glamorous, they do these fantastic things. They, they have waggle dances. They form giant swarms of thousands of bees. They also fly and sting a lot. And those two things make them harder to work with. So I switched over to my tiny little tenothorax. <laughs> but I have to admit, the bees have a lot of glamour. It turns out, though, that, that they do, they actually have a lot in common in terms of house hunting with tenothorax. They also live in cavities rather than building their own nests. They also have a core of scouts, specialist scouts, who go off to, to find nests and assess them and recruit one another. They also have a quality dependent recruitment. And they also even have a quorum rule. They have all of the same features. Um, but it turns out they, they may also have another feature that w w it's not clear the ants have. Now, I, I don't know if we can turn the sound up, if there's sound in here. If not, let me just turn up the sound here and see if it makes a difference. I think we're only hearing it here. Okay, it's all right. I'll, this often happens, and I'm capable of providing the acoustic, I think, the acoustic component myself. So watch this bee here. This, is, this bee here is is waggle dancing. So she is advertising the location of a potential new home. And this pink bee here is not waggle dancing, but she's following the waggler, and she's butting her head into her, and she's making a little noise that goes something like <coughs> or <coughs> that's not right. <coughs> Can't do it quite right. I need to like smoke a cigarette or something, I think I'll get away from it. It's called the stop signal. And it has the, the effect of reducing subsequent dancing by that waggle dance. Now, what you don't know about the pink bee is that she is herself a scout, but she has found another site, a competing site. And she is essentially not only, what she does is she goes back and forth between advertising her site positively, sort of the equivalent of our tanner buttons, and trash talking the other site, right? Essentially doing the stop signal to discourage dancers from the other site. And there, it's going both ways. So you have, when you have a competition, it's not only a positive competition of advertisement, it's a negative competition of inhibition. And this, is a, this was a really interesting finding when it came out a few years ago. This is from Tom Seeley's lab. Um, and because it, it's very reminiscent of certain models of how decision making works in the primate brain. And um, I can, at the, greatly oversimplifying, uh, if you imagine a situation in which we have, let's say, a rhesus monkey who has is, is been trained on some kind of discrimination task of involving visual stimuli, and, and it has to choose either option A or option B by looking to the left or looking to the right. And uh, the idea is that as it's making its decision, sen sensory information is coming in in two channels. There's evidence in favor of option A on the left here and evidence in favor of option B on the right. And so there are neural centers gathering that information, but then feeding it to higher centers, which accumulate the data, in essence, in, in the form of greater and greater activity levels. Once one or the other of these two accumulating centers surpasses a threshold activity level, that constitutes the choice. The monkey decides and looks left or right, whichever one it is that surpasses it first. So if you think about that, that has an awful lot in common with what I, with what I just described for the ants, where basically you have ants bringing data in about competing sites, and once one of them surpasses this quorum threshold, then we go boom into the commitment phase and start transporting the colony there. And so this, this what's called the race model, and you can see why, we have two independent processes racing each other to a completion in which everyone gets there first, that is the decision. It's, it's a pretty good model for what the ants do. But it turns out in the neural systems there is another component. There's inhibition. The, the channel A is not only exciting um, upstream parts of channel A, it's also inhibiting channel B and vice versa. That's what goes on in neural centers. It's also apparently what goes on in the honeybees. And why, why this is so interesting is because this model, but not the race model, is capable of a sort of mathematical optimization of the trade-off between speed and accuracy. So basically, you can take your time and gather a lot of data and make sure you make the correct choice, or you can make a snappier decision on smaller amounts of data and, and get the job done faster, right? It's hard to do both. Um, but the idea is, for any given level of, of, of error probability, 
that you choose, uh, this kind of model with the inhibition will be capable of achieving that in the minimum time. That's not true of the race model. So the mutual inhibition enhances the, the ability of this, of this kind of system to trade off speed and accuracy. The bees apparently have that. It's not clear to us that the ants do, but there is at least a candidate's um, a behavior that might play this role. And that is what you see here. This video here, what is this ant doing? It looks like she's not feeling well. What's, what ha what's happened to this ant is she's been confined to a nest for, for experimental reasons that made sense at the time. I won't describe them now, but and they didn't work, but they did allow us to discover that when you distress an ant, this is what she does. And it turns out she is emitting a pheromone that is produced by her mandibular gland. It's a lar rather large gland at the base of her mandible. That's what it is. It's called 2,5-dimethylpyrazine. It smells kind of like chocolate. You can buy it from Sigma. It's a food additive. Um, but they use it as a kind of alarm pheromone. And essentially, if they've been distressed, they release this thing. It doesn't cause any really obvious change in behavior. In most contexts, it doesn't cause any obvious change in behavior to other ants. But what we found is that if an ant releases this stuff inside a nest cavity, that nest cavity becomes very unattractive to subsequent ants. So basically, a, a nest that's been marked by these pheromones, if it's pitted against an otherwise identical but unmarked nest, and you give a, co a colony a chance to move into it, the colony will almost always choose the unmarked nest. And no one gets upset. There's no um, you know, obvious alarm or, or aggression or anything like that, but there seems to be this reluctance to move into or recruit to a site that's been marked. So what this is at least a candidate, then, for an inhibitory signal, which ants could use to, uh, to, to in, inhibit recruitment to one site while enhancing it to another by doing candor marks. We don't know that, but it's, it's, it's um, in the same way that those, uh, the honeybee stop signal's role was discovered after those models were made, and, and the search for it was kind of inspired by those models, we kind of think it may be worth looking around for this kind of inhibitory signal in the ants, but you have to stay tuned for whether that's really the case. Um, I, I just wanted this slide is um, a little bit look, look like a firework display. It's, um, this is some recent work we've done where we're trying to make up for some of our oversimplification. So I've been talking about these ants as though there's just two kinds of ants. There's scout ants and then there's passive ants. It turns out though, and fact, we always knew this, but we were just kind of, kind of you know, making a first approximation, those scout ants are actually quite diverse in their behavior. And the passive ants also are actually quite diverse in their behavior. What we've done recently is, is accumulate very large amounts of data on marked ants and try to apply network science methods and some machine learning algorithms to categorize the behavior of these ants. And so what we found is that we can at least, we can usefully categorize them in, not into two categories, but four categories. And so the active ants are divided really into what we call primary ants, who do most of the tandem running and a lot of the transport. And then these secondary ants, who are very active in transport, but generally don't do a lot of tandem running. And then we have the, the truly passive ants, who are just like furniture. They just get moved from one thing to the other. And then we have what we call wandering ants, who, who appear very active. They move, they, they discover, they, they, they assess sites, but they never do anything. They never, they never recruit anyone. And they may have a, an unappreciated role, or it could be that they are just doing other work, like perhaps foraging simultaneously with the move. We're not sure. But they, the distinction between the primary ants and the secondary ants we think is kind of interesting. They form a sort of network core here where they talk to each other a lot. There's a lot of mutual uh, communication among members of this core. And what we're entertaining is the idea that there, it may be useful actually to take the basic job of scouting and separate it into two pieces. One is the sort of a discovery and assessment um, role, and the other one is the execution role, the, the, tra the, the rapid transport role. And so now that we've sort of found a way to identify these kinds of ants, we, we want to do manipulative experiments where we make artificial colonies with different proportions of primary and secondary ants and see how that affects function. Um, OK, so that's a lot about the mechanism of how these ants um, uh, carry out this collective behavior. Uh, I guess I want to talk maybe a little bit now about the sort of implications of this for function. Um, one of the great things about uh, these colonies is that you can, you can analogize them to a brain, which is kind of what I'm doing, right? You know, in a brain, neurons interact, and from these interactions emerges cognition. In a colony, ants interact, and from their interaction emerges a, a different kind of cognition, collective cognition, collective decisions, as, as you've seen. But the important difference, though, is that the neurons of a brain, you can't really take a neuron of a brain out of the brain and have it make decisions on its own. At least I can't. Maybe some of you can. 
Um, but you can do that with an individual ant. They are sufficiently independent still that they can, they can act as decision makers in their own right. So we've done a series of experiments um, where we, we compare the ability of a single ant and the ability of a colony to solve some kind of decision problem. And what, we are, what we're kind of inspired by is this idea of a wisdom of crowds. And there's a, there's a lot of famous examples of wisdom of crowds, but it all goes back to the, a, a famous experiment of sorts by Francis Galton back in the early 20th century in which he gathered all of these um, uh, data from a county fair in England in which people you know, paid a little bit of money to guess the weight of an ox. And then the, you know, whoever got close, whoever's guess was closest, uh, they got, I don't know, they got to keep the ox or something. I'm not sure what the prize was. And, but what he, he has like a thousand guesses, and they were all over the map, some very high, some very low, a few of them quite close, most of them not. But if you take the average of all those guesses, the average is like a pound off, and you know, the ox weighs 1,000 pounds, and it's only it's like one in 1,000 units off. It's a, very, it's a very precise and accurate guess, if you take the average. So the idea is that if you, take the, if you somehow combine many um, noisy estimations, you can get a better collective estimation as a result. Ants, an ant colony is by definition a bunch of potentially noisy or inefficient or inaccurate or biased, imprecise um, estimators or actors. Maybe the colony can do better than an individual ant. And to find out, we have to give them these, these challenges where we, we basically give the same puzzle to an individual ant and to a, to a um, colony. So uh, we've done a bunch of these. I'm just going to describe one example, and it has to do with what you can see here. So let me, there's a question there, which now with this lighting, this, this, I'm not, this may make this problem harder than it normally is, but that's fine. I still think this is probably a pretty easy one to solve, right? If I ask you which square is darker, it's, it's, the, right, it's the left one, right? The left one is darker. But I can make it a little harder. I can make the, the right one a little darker, and then I can make the right one a little darker still, and I'm making it darker and darker and darker, right? And eventually you reach a point here where it's really hard to tell which one is darker. Now you know that you're probably catching on here. The left one is always the darker one. And in fact, this is a method uh, from, the, from psychophysics, which is the science of studying the, um, uh, the, the, the psychology of perception of physical quantities like, like light level. This is a, a method, widely used method, for determining how well an individual can discriminate levels of a stimulus, in this case, light level. And the, it's, it's the constant comparison method. And the idea is you take a person or an animal and you present them with a large number of binary choices like this in random order. And in every case, the, the, the subject doesn't know this, but in every case, one of the, um, the squares or the stimuli is constant. It's always exactly the same value, but the other one is varied. Uh, and in this case, the other one is always brighter than the constant. The comparison is always brighter. And what you do is you just find out how often the, the subject gets the right answer. The right answer is always the constant one. The constant one is always the one that's darker. But uh, the, again, the subject doesn't know that. And so you just gather data over a large number of these Basically, comparis comparisons of differing difficulty. Big differences to tiny differences, and you see how well they do. And the idea is that you, we vary across this horizontal axis, we're varying the brightness of the comparison. So as we go from left to right here, we're getting easier decisions, right? There's the constant up there, it's dark. And we either have uh, comparisons that are just barely brighter than the constant through to ones which are much, much brighter. And you just give a bunch of these, you, know, you repeatedly do this to these, these uh, subjects. And you get a lot of data like that, it takes a while, but to get a lot of data like that, you can then take the, 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 the proportions of correct decisions across these choices of varying difficulty and plot a function to relate them to each other. And this is a very typical psychophysical function here. This is, you very see this, uh, this step-like step function. And there's a lot of ways mathematically of modeling this relationship, but the one I've shown here has a, some nice features because it has some easily interpretable parameters that if you fit this function to your data. One of them, alpha here, you can interpret as the halfway point, the difference between constant and comparison at which the subject gets about halfway from their minimum to their maximum performance. And then lambda, the maximum accuracy, that's as good as they're gonna get. And it might be one, they might always get it or it might be something less than that. Now we did this with ants. And the, the, the reason we were able to do this, we can't ask the ants which one, like I just asked you, but what we can, it, it, I mentioned before, they care about a lot of features in nests. One of them is light level. They hate bright nests. If you give them a dark nest and a bright nest that are otherwise equivalent, it's more or less guaranteed they'll pick the dark one as long as they can tell the difference. So we gave, we gave them these choices of, with varying differences in brightness between two nests, 
And we did this both for whole colonies, but also for single ants. We took single ants and we made them do this job themselves. And we were relieved from the data on the individual ants that they show a nice, normal-looking psychophysical function. Because we were kind of concerned that you take an ant out of the colony, she's just going to panic and go crazy and do nothing very rational. But actually, no, she seems to be trying to do the right thing. And so as the brightness difference increases and the problem becomes easier, her performance goes up. And it goes up in this sort of step-like way. So that was, that was nice. But that's our individual level baseline. What about colonies? So the first thing about colonies is, if you look at the, ver at the hard problems, the ones where the brightness level is very small, they do you know, notably better than, than individuals. Uh, so in other words, we can interpret this as a sort of wisdom of crowds effect. Uh, it's consistent with what that kind of general philosophy would predict, that the group is able to make finer distinctions uh, than, the, um, than the individual. And we would attribute this to something kind of like these, this whole positive feedback process I described. It basically, um, this quorum rule can amplify tiny differences in, in how ants at one site are treating it versus ants at another site. So we get this kind of amplification and, and uh, stronger distinguishing between small differences than the individuals are capable of by themselves. But an interesting thing happened when we looked at the easier problems, and that is that if there's a really big difference, then the individuals do a, better than the colonies, just a little bit better. But they do better, and it's a pretty consistent effect. We repeated this, we got some more data, and we still saw the same thing. And you know, I'm not entirely sure why this happens, but I would put forward um, a kind of a general sort of explanation, which it has to do with another aspect of collective decision making, the sort of downside of collective decision making. We have to remember that um, these ants, as I said at the, at the outset, they're doing this work in a highly decentralized way. Right? If you think about, about that Francis Galton story, it sounds decentralized, right? Each of the villagers is making their independent estimates. That part is decentralized, and it's highly independent. But the part where Francis Galton shows up and adds them all up and divides by n and gets the average, that's a highly centralized you know, information processing mechanism. The ants don't have a Francis Galton. There's nobody there to gather the data. What they have instead is that process I described before of competing races and positive feedback. And positive feedback is great, right? It can, it can be usefully amplify small differences. But sometimes it can go the other way. Sometimes rather than getting the wisdom of crowds, you get the mad madness of crowds, right? You get groupthink. You get an initial error is amplified and becomes everyone's mistake. It doesn't happen all the time. It happens hopefully rather rarely, but I, it does sometimes happen. And so my guess would be that out of this end here, individuals can pretty much always get it right. It's an easy problem for an individual. But colonies will sometimes, due to bad luck, amplify a small mistake and get it wrong. Um, and uh, that's just the, the sort of double-edged sword of, 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 positive feed, of, of decision mechanisms that rely on positive feedback. Now, the last thing I want to talk about here, I want to return to this tandem run that I showed earlier. Um, because my focus here has been very much on the collective. That's the kind of idea to understand collective information processing. But tandem runs, you know, if we expand this to think about information processing in general, and if we note how important this communication um, uh, uh, behavior is to, to all of these uh, collective behaviors, then it's worth a closer look in its own right. And in the earlier things I've been talking about, you know, we borrowed these ideas from psychology and neurobiology to try to understand the ants. In this case, we borrow some ideas from, from information theory to try to understand a little bit more about this behavior. So what's going on in this behavior, right? I mean, the simplest way to describe it, the way I, I always thought about it since I first learned about it you know, back in, as, as an undergraduate, it's like a knowledgeable teacher leading a pupil. It's like taking someone by the hand and saying, follow me, come with me, and I'll show you something really interesting. And then you get there, and you know, it's a nice nest, or it's a, it's a puddle of sugar water. Um, and that, you know, that seems like a pretty fair description of what's going on. The problem with that um, description, though, is that it's not quite enough for the ant to be shown the end. She has to do something else. If this is going to be useful recruitment, she now needs to be able to go back to the nest and then return independently on her own. If it's food, she needs to be able to return so, so she can shuttle food back and forth. That's what they do. They, they drink up some sugar, they bring it back to the nest, they offload it, and they go back and get more. If it's a nest, she needs to be able to go back and forth and, and also recruit nest mates herself. Right? Otherwise, it's not much use. Um, so she needs to have learned not just about the existence of this place of interest, but how to get there. Right? Now, our, our, um, I mentioned before that these ants are, are different from your sort of, the, the sort of ant who might first pop into your head, you know, an ant who follows a chemical trail. 
Um, they don't follow chemical trails, right? Their navigation, it turns out, is largely visual. And I was surprised at that uh, because they, if you look at them closely, they have tiny little eyes, really small eyes, like 100 facets. So I would have thought these ants don't rely on vision very much, but actually they rely very heavily on it. You can see it in an experiment like this. So th these ants are small, right? So we can create an entire world in this tray here. This is the bird's eye view of this tray with a nest entrance right there. The, the nest is right below that entrance and a new nest entrance over here. It's just about 10 or 15 centimeters away. And this thing is, is um, it's just about, it's a dinner plate actually. It's something I got it at a grocery store. It's, it's about this big, it's made out of plastic. And it's, I put it in the middle of this big cylinder, like a meter diameter cylinder that surrounds it. And on the inner wall of the cylinder, I have um, uh, put a large photograph of the ant's natural environment. In other words, the inside of my lab. So that if they look around, they'll see these visual cues. Uh, and, but it's completely contained within that cylinder. And then what we can do, we can get them to start an immigration. And as they're going along, halfway through, I rotate the cylinder. So the visual world that surrounds them is rotated 90 degrees. And what we find is that their paths also rotate. So they start off going more or less directly from the old nest to the new nest as they're emigrating. But once you do this, this um, rotation, to the clockwise rotation of 90 degrees, their paths shift. The substrate is exactly the same as it ever was. The nest is are still located exactly where it was, but the visual cues that they see around them have all shifted, and so have their paths. So they're basically looking around them, and they are aligning themselves with these learned visual patterns they see in their environment. That, oh, yeah, and here you can just see a sort of summary of that data that, that where the blue dots indicate they're heading before the shift, and the red dots they're heading after the shift. That suggested that maybe, what the, maybe what's happening in the tandem run is that the follower is walking along, and she's not just getting led and saying, okay, I can't wait to see what goodies you have for me. It's that she's looking around. She's looking around and she's learning. She's learning the visual cues. And so a former student of mine, now a professor at the University of Georgia, Taka Sasaki, he did this experiment here, where he set up a little arena here and he just studded it with all kinds of little visual objects. If you look closely, they will look suspiciously like drawings of Legos, which is because he used Legos. Plus some, some other flotsam and jetsam and odds and ends around the lab, different colors, different shapes. And basically he's, he has these, this, he, this is a foraging experiment, so they're going back and forth from food to nest. And they're leading tandem runs, and then the, the follower of those tandem runs are then independently later visiting on their own. And so he, he predicted that, well, if they're learning visual cues, then they should actually learn when they follow, when they independently walk on their own after following a tandem run, they should follow pretty much the same route they were led on, right? And if you have one ant who was led over here, her tandem run led her over here to the left, and another ant, her tandem run led her over here to the right, then their subsequent paths should differ, right? They should, they should do the one they were, the one they were taught. And he, that's, with quite a bit of noise, that's pretty much what he saw. So the first thing you see here is the paths are all over the map. This is just a whole bunch of separate paths. Uh, they are color coded according to whether they were the original tandem run to the food, the red one, whether they were the follower's trip back home at the end of the tandem run after she got some food, or, or green, whether that same follower's outward trip back to the food on her own. The fact that this looks like spaghetti is actually good news because it means it, there's not some simple environmental cue that tells everyone where to go. It's not like a chemical trail or even just some, some collection of visual cues that is, leads to the obviously best path. Everyone is getting their own path. The question is, is your idiosyncratic path like the one you learned or is it just something you made up on your own? And it looks like, indeed, it's like the one they learned. This is a, a particularly clear example, uh, but it holds up statistically that the, th this red line shows the path of a tandem run from nest to food. The blue line shows the follower going back home. Totally different path. But when she decides to come back to get the food again, she pretty much follows the path she was taught. And this is essentially what you see typically with most followers, that they follow the path they learned. So they're actually learning. There's a lot more going on here than just being led to a site. They're actually learning this path. And this, I, you know, this, I thought this was interesting and everything, but I realized that it, it didn't really, I hadn't really kind of fully clued in on what, what's going on with these tandem runs as a result of, of realizing this until we did um, this, this last analysis I want to describe for you where we applied information theory tools to understand 
how these guys work. And so basically, what we're, what we're describing here is, is a, um, or what we tried to do was say, can we use the idea of transfer entropy? And I won't, I won't describe too much about that, what that is, except to say this. Transfer entropy is a numerical measurement, a quantitative measurement of how much one individual's behavior predicts the future behavior of another individual after we've already controlled for that individual's past. So basically, how much does, does a leader say alter the future behavior of a follower? How much, how much does our knowing what the leader did tell us what the follower is going to do? Or, and vice versa. And so to apply this, you need to take large numbers of these paths, and what we do is we coarse grain them. And so we can describe the paths as a series of yes, no things, basically. So, and we do it in one of two ways. In one way, we just look at whether the ants are moving or not. Because you saw, the, 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 there's, it's very stop and go, right? They stop, they go, they stop, they go. So we just, we just describe the um, tandem run as a series of uh, move, not move um, uh, statements of varying uh, uh, duration. Or we instead do it in terms of their direction. Are they, are they going left compared to the direction they were going before, or are they going right? So it's basically, we're gathering two different pieces of information about the path, the, the pausing pattern and the direction. Now, if you, um, what's nice about transfer entropy is you can quantify the direction, the, the sort of net direction of in which information is, is, uh, is moving. Is it moving from leader to follower or perhaps from follower to leader? What we see, if you look at the rotations and look only at the direction, then you see a result which I, I think should be unsurprising. It's very much leader to follower. After all, the leader knows where to go, right? She's the one determining the path. She says, oh, we've got to go left here, and then we've got to go right. She's the one who knows where to go. The follower has no idea where to go. She just follows. And indeed, this transfer entropy analysis supports that. Information flows from leader to follower. But what's interesting, if you instead look at the pausing pattern, it's the other way around. The follower, it's the follower's pauses that predict the leaders. And, and, and this, this, I found this a very interesting conclusion because the way I've always thought about these tandem runs, and I, maybe you did too, or, or maybe you're smarter than me when you look at those videos, I always, I watch them going along, and I said, oops, the follower got lost. And then she goes, where, where, where's the leader? She seems kind of worried. I just think of her as being worried or panicky. And then she finds the leader. Ah, great, I found her again. And then they move on. And then they get lost again. And, they, and then she finds them again. And it's like a constant, you know, ebb and flow of separation and reunion. Um, but I think I was thinking about that wrong. I think it's not that the follower is getting lost and then trying to find the leader. It's that she's saying, okay, hold up here, stop a second. I've got to look around and remember this. And I, she goes back and forth. She says, okay, fine. She goes up, taps, let's go. It's gonna move on. And then, okay, stop again, sorry, gotta stop. So she's basically driving a pattern of pauses in order for her to learn, rather than simply occasionally getting lost and then using these signals to stay together to resume connection. And part of the reason I think that's true is because it turns out I have a, a postdoc working in my lab who works on termites. I, I don't know anything about termites. He knows a lot about termites. One thing he knew about termites that I didn't know is that termites also do tandem runs. So, um, but they do them in a very different situation. They don't do them to recruit. It's not like a termite who knows where something good is leads a naive termite there. Instead, what happens is early in the, um, and th th these are newly mated pairs of king and queen termites. And they, they stay together in these termites and these tandem runs, and they move around searching the environment to find a suitable place to start their nest. So they're not returning to a site that one of them knows. They're just searching. So in this case, it really is the case. The only function of the tandem run is to keep them together. Me mechanistically, it's really very similar, but functionally, it has a different role. And the interesting thing there is if you look at, if you do the same analysis on the termites, then it's all leader to follower. The, the direction is leader to follower. The pausing pattern is leader to follow. The leader is in charge. The follower really is just being held by the hand and dragged along. Because she doesn't need to learn anything. She just needs to stay together with the, with the leader. And that, for me, at least, that was a big insight. It changed the way I think about the way this communication system works. And it also changed my attitude about this. What do you think is going on here? Uh, I, I was pretty impressed by this when we first made this. What that, I call that an ant robot is actually just a little magnet with some plastic on it that has been doused with the pheromone that the leaders secrete to attract followers. And as you can see, she's attracted, it's like a super tandem run. She's got like six followers. I thought, we've really done it, now we've cracked it. And then we're gonna use this robot to manipulate, to do fake tandem runs and manipulate collective decision making, all this kind of stuff. But the problem is you watch, if, you, if they eventually get to their destination, all those ants get led there, or even if we do it more judiciously, only one gets there. 
she doesn't learn anything. She wanders off and she never returns. And it doesn't matter whether the site was good or the food was good. She seems not to know how to get back. And I think the problem is we are not doing this right. That's entirely leader driven. The leader, there's no feedback there at all. The, the robot is just moving and, and, the, and the followers are desperately trying to catch up. They don't, they're not in charge of this thing, right? So this is like, um, it's like a, a, a teacher-centered versus a, a, a student-centered teaching, right? The, we're all supposed to do this, but the, it's student-driven. Students are supposed to be able to control the rate, the pace of learning, um, and we weren't doing that here. This was just the, 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 um, um, the, the, the arrogant uh, instructor just barging ahead through all the material without bothering to find out whether the, um, the student learned anything, and, and she didn't. So we have to revise this robot if we want to do that, that thing again, which I feel, hope is something we can do in the future. So let me just wrap up um, um, to say you know, that it's a bunch of different things I talked about. Um, I think that you know, in addition to trying to tell you something about what we learned about how these colonies work, um, it's also something about the power of borrowing all these ideas from different sources, from psychology, from neuroscience, from, from computer science, and sort of working uh, what I think are useful metaphors between colonies and other living uh, systems, brains, for example, or, or human societies, and using those to then uh, uh, forge a better understanding of how this particular decentralized system worked. And ultimately, you know, if we can understand this system better, and uh, these metaphors maybe pr prove a little bit stronger than that, or, and something where we can perhaps uncover general principles that would apply uh, not only to ant colonies, but also to other kinds of systems. And I, lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge a number of people, especially the people who did uh, some of the, uh, the, a lot of the laborious work in the second half of the talk, uh, Takao Sasaki, Gabriela Valentini, and, and Nobuaki Mizumoto, uh, and then a number of colleagues and students over the years, and of course, um, many uh, generous funders, and thank you all for listening. that, for example, if you have A, which is of inferior quality to B, and you move uh, A closer, at some point the quorum would yeah. work. Have you looked whether that's linear? Or yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, the question is about the effects of distance on this whole mm -hmm. decision-making yeah. system. I have not, like, well, informally, um, Nigel Franks, another uh, uh, person who's done a lot of uh, pioneering work in this system, has. And we interpret the results a little differently. I, I think he would interpret it as saying that they actually managed to solve that problem and still picked a better nest. I would say that they initially, their system fails them. And that if the, if the one nest is closer, even if it's worse, I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna move into that one. But then there will be a second stage of emigration where they, they, it's like a leapfrogging thing, where they then move again. The other thing that can sometimes happen is that they may split. And the same kind of thing happened. There has to be a second stage. And actually, the, I think that the reason, part of the reason I think they do that is because uh, I'm, I, that I think this is really a functional behavior is because they seem to have a, a, a specific system for doing that, which looks different from, from what I've described here. It, it relies on a very small number of extremely busy ants who then reunify the divided colony. So yeah, so they have other tricks up their sleeve to deal with, with the, the, the limitations of what I've described here. Are those fixed, or will they change over the lifetime again? Oh, yes, yeah, are those rules fixed? Um, that data was gathered over a relatively short period of time, I would say about a month. And these ants can live for years, like two or three years. So I don't know the question to that. My, I, would, I would suppose, one thing I'm almost certain of is that young ants in their first months of their lives are all passive, and that they age into a more functional role. Now whether they, the, the more functional roles, the wandering, the, the secondary and primary, whether those are fixed or changeable, um, I'm not sure, but I, my, because we haven't done that kind of experiment, that's what, one of the experiments I'd like to do now. My guess is, is, is that there's, there's inherent flexibility. So for example, if you were to remove all the primary ants, I'm pretty sure other ants would step up and take over that role, but we haven't actually done the experiment yet, so that's just a speculation. As I see all binary, do you think it would generalize to a possible choice? Yeah, we, we have done some, most, almost always we use two, uh, but we have done some things where we use more than two. And they, I, I, 
in, insofar as we can tell, the methods seem very similar. What, I'll tell you one experiment we've done that used, it, used actually eight. And if we have eight nests, half of them are identical and good, half of them are identical and sort of mediocre. Um, an individual ant is really, really bad at solving that problem. Essentially, they just, it's a random choice, which whether they'll end up in a good one or a mediocre one at the end of the day, it's 50-50. But a colony can still handle it very well. And they will simply pick one of the four good ones and move into it. And again, we sort of interpret that as a, as a kind of cognitive load problem that it's just too much data for one ant to, have, you know, one ant to, to deal with. But if you're, if you're a, an ant in a colony, you don't have to visit all eight of these places. You can just visit one or two and, and, and other ants will take care of the rest, yeah. So, so they do seem to be able to solve that problem even with that many, yeah. Um, the, the, the learning pauses that the, the follower does, how, how is that affected by the complexity of the arena? Mm -hmm. and, and the second, you know, quick question, who moves the queen and how is that? What's that? What's the second one again? Oh, who moves it? Okay, those are good questions. Especially the first one. That's my, that's my next question about that. My, I don't know the answer to that, that your first question there, um, which was, um, uh, uh, hold on, yeah, oh, about the complexity of the environment. So I, we have a prediction about that, right? Which is that we should be able to repeat that analysis in two environments. One that's, let's say, information rich, and one that's information poor, or one that's easy to learn, or one that's hard to learn. And we would, I would predict that will affect the, 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 the information flow that we see, but also maybe some more obvious things, like how long it takes them to go, how well they recapitulate the route. We haven't done that experiment yet, but I think that's when it's aching to be done. In terms of the queen, um, again, Nigel Franks, again, working with a different species, he found this interesting pattern where the queen, she's moved just like everybody else, but the timing, and she, you know, they're strong, they can carry her. It's a little unwieldy sometimes, but one ant can carry the queen. But she tends to be moved towards in the middle sort of, you know, uh, uh, half, if you will, of the emigration. She's not going to be one of the first moved. She's not going to be one of the last. That might be a sort of mechanistic byproduct of where she is. She tends to be in the middle of the pile of ants, and if you just go up there and grab something, you're probably not going to grab her. But it's, it's, it, could, it could be more than that. It could be that there's a sort of functional element that um, you don't want to move her too soon, because what if you're moving her to the wrong nest? You don't want to leave her unprotected there by, a, by a, just a handful of ants. And you don't want to leave, move her too late for the same reason. You don't want to leave her behind. So, but, but other than that, other than the timing, she's just another ant. Yeah. Maybe over there. Um, what happens when two or more colonies decide to move in the same uh, spots? Oh, wow, seems that's a good question. Okay, so, so there's a whole series of experiments we're doing now, which is I guess, funded, unsurprisingly, by the Department of Defense, in which we make the ants fight with each other, which makes me feel a little bad, because we've always, we've always just had them, it's all been very peaceful, they're just in there by themselves, and we see how they think. But now, we do exactly that situation. So you've got two, well, we do it different ways. I'll tell you the one we've done. Um, there's two colonies in a tray. One of them is in a, a really good nest, and the other one is in a really bad nest. And they've been there for a while, right? And we set it up, and it's a little bit, it's kind of an incitement here, really, because the idea, we kind of expect that the ants in the poor nest will attempt to move into the better nest, thus setting off some sort of combat. And our idea was to look at how they organize uh, uh, collective defense and collective offense. Uh, and what we found so far is one thing, they aren't, they're, not, they're not really great fighters, they don't do a lot of fighting, uh, but they do have a sort of interesting kind of war of attrition that goes on. So it is, it is aggressive, I mean the short answer to the question is they fight. But they fight in an interesting way, it's not just wholesale slaughter and you know, chopping heads off and this sort of thing. They, it can last for days, and for the most part it consists of ants from one colony, like in little gangs of two or three, grabbing ants from another colony, uh, latching onto their legs and, and sort of stretching them out and pinning them under the ground. And they'll just stand there stock still for hours. And eventually it ends. And it, it, as far as I can tell, no one seemed to have been hurt. So there may have been some, you know, some lost dignity or something there, but, but, it's, but it's, it, it, it's not like anyone lost a limb. Um, but at the end of all of this, and it's, we're still not sure how, somebody wins, one of the colonies wins. It's usually the colony that started off in the better nest which might imply some advantages, you know, some sort of advantages to the better defense, right, provided that way, but not always. Um, and what, it, all of those ants who didn't die, if they didn't die but they lost, what does that mean? They end up merging into the, into the nest of the winner. The only real loser is the queen of the losing colony who almost always ends up dead. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, I guess we'll, uh, sorry about that. <laughs>